Good morning. It's Monday, the 10th of July, and I'm Govind Rajayathi Raj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top reports and themes for the day: India's rural areas will drive the growth of super rich in coming years, even as India's middle class is set to hit 715 million in seven years. What indeed is the internationalization of the rupee? And hmm, the Swiss will actually import more cheese than they export. More globalization lessons. And India goes deficit to surplus rains in days as high intensity monsoons hit different parts of the country. This is a core report with Govind Raj Atiraj. India's booming middle class. India's middle class has been growing for a while. Based on this largely true presumption and assumption, a whole bunch of businesses have taken bets on how they would consume and spend their incomes. I'm talking about the middle class. The latest to join the party were all kinds of tech-enabled consumer-facing ventures funded by well venture capital. Now, a new report titled "The Rise of India's Middle Class," which is built on responses from 40,000 households in 25 states. has projected that india's middle class will rise from 432 million that's in 2021 to 715 million or 47% of the population in 2030-31 or 7 years from now the middle class as defined here could be anywhere between 5 lakh rupees to 30 lakh rupees of annual income in household terms presumably this is where the problem could be but we'll come back to that later Significantly, the People's Research on India's Consumer Economy and India's Citizen Environment, or Price Report, says that rural areas will drive the growth of India's super-rich households to 9.1 million in seven years, or 2030-31. The overall number is expected to go further to over a billion middle-class people by 2047. But in deference and regard to the views of several economists and investors I've interacted with, I try and avoid going too far out into the future. Now, coming back to the next seven years or so, India will see a five-fold increase in its super-rich households, and significantly, like I mentioned before, a large chunk of that growth will come from rural areas. Super-rich households are those who earn more than two crore rupees annually, and they are now 1.8 million or 18 lakh of them. Half of these super-rich live between Maharashtra, which is a large state, and Delhi, a small state. From a marketer's point of view, obviously, as the number of middle-class households rise, the demand for higher quality or higher-priced products and services increases. We're already seeing a premiumization in the economy for products ranging from cars, consumer appliances, to even houses. Now, the worrying part of this is that the difference between the lowest-income households and their more well-to-do counterparts, as the average All India household income figure stands at rupees 5.43 lakhs in 2021. So the poor have to struggle with between seventy-eight thousand rupees to two hundred and seventy-eight thousand rupees per year. To understand more on what this report found, and more importantly, how to read the findings and potentially the pitfalls, I reached out to Dr. Rajesh Shukla, CEO of Price. Dr. Shukla incidentally spent over sixteen years earlier at the National Council for Applied Economic Research, including as chief statistician. I began by asking him to describe the findings. the size is 7% middle class by 2030 and there are very conservative actually i can just say the assumption it is not like we have assumed something big gdp growth we have assumed approximately 6.5 to 7% during this period in that period another is urbanization urbanization is currently 36% and we are assuming by 2030 31 it is 40 41% and the population growth as usual means whatever it is running so i am saying these are the three basic assumption which is behind that and more important is the data behind this which is very very important we are basing mostly from our national survey which is pan india survey from the 2014 2016 and 2021 and that has gone into the entire exercise and this data is coming from the approximately 40 to 60000 household and scientifically selected from the 25 state covering both rural and urban india so if indeed we reach this and obviously we're also on the way from that 31 to 47% what is the manifestation of this what will happen to the consumer consumption behavior uh, in terms of what kind of products what kind of services and so on so these are the people those who have moved just from the poverty and the art aspiration level 
so they are now less likely to fall back again in the poverty so they are having comfortable economic security and that economic security make them to invest further for their children's education for the you can say making them skilled much better skilled people for their growth and second thing is like as you are saying consumption pattern when people actually get the their house in right uh, in terms of economic stability they move from the discretionary expenditure and these discretionary expenditure which is actually the very high and in terms of like looking good looking good means like the parlor or the beauty or the you can say health and education or the transportation tour and travel and most important thing is demand of the luxury good items from the basic model of mobile to the you can say the apple type of mobile from the second segment car to the high segment car so it is going to have higher impact over in terms of consumption and it is going to pump according to our calculation we are expecting the economy size will be approximately 7.1 trillion dollar and then consumption spend economy will be approximately 5.2 trillion dollar at that time and the interesting thing is the half of them whatever incremental consumption is happening is going by the middle class also second important thing which is very important half of the 55% also in the rural india of this incremental consumption so understanding rural much better is very very important so middle class you are defining as uh, 5 to 30 lakh rupees per annum is that correct yeah okay so there is this classic question right we've had a certain definition of middle class all these years many marketers and let's say brands or even e-commerce platforms have misread that market have overestimated so could people make mistakes if they don't analyze this a little more carefully for example oh, absolutely uh, gobit i always say the user should be more knowledgeable than the producer of the data because the middle class will be approximately 47% but one has to understand the middle class living in metro and middle class are living in the you can say countryside if 75 million household uh, if suppose uh, going to increase between 10 years half of them in rural half of them in urban india so those who are in the rural they are different from the urban actually their requirement income is one criteria to define but their need their expression is entirely different actually so understanding as you saying govind it is very very important one has to understand what this report define is how the middle class of bihar is different from the punjab how the actually the kolkata middle class is different from the even chennai versus the mumbai versus the delhi there are a huge difference so diversity so number help but you can say planning and strategy need to be understand these middle class much much better way and i am saying those who are understanding there is no actually the problem in making their choices but those who are not clearly understanding certainly then as as much as it is powerful information it might also go otherwise so you found that the richest city in india in terms of sheer buying power is not what we think it is tell us about what you found and uh, why it is so actually the concentration of richness is still in the big city like metro delhi or mumbai but interesting thing is coming the growth and growth which is i am saying absorption of growth in the metros are actually 6 to 7% in terms of richest household but you take the smaller city like malappuram like kozhikode or even surat all these things are going in double digit actually 10 to 12% which is much much higher we are looking at the smaller cities those who are very well connected in two way first thing is the connected with the very well in the open economy and also having the diverse economy which is having a lot of pumping coming like malapuram is coming because of remittances majority are the actually they also look like the muslims and other community i i am very happy to mention that they are going much much faster than mumbai actually so these are the new geography coming in india so my submission is corporate even the government need to take care of because until unless income is growing the gap of enterprise structure and facility and other thing is not going to meet then it will be not cash for the development or growth of the country so i am saying that this strategy need to be just a rework reorient and the last thing also i would like to just mention in this connection is the government need money to serve them they have to tax better 
So more people need to be unreasoned, bring into tax system. When people become richer, they normally move from the government services to, you can say, because of other region, health or education, go to the private, actually, hospital, private schools, private travel, private hotels. So in this case, government need to spend a lot of money to create better infrastructure for these in the local areas. Otherwise, it will be an opportunity for something, but growth can't be actually harsened until unless you providing the better services. So you're saying some communities, obviously it's a rising tide and a rising tide is uh, lifting communities which are otherwise disadvantaged in other parts at the same level then as they are maybe in the richer cities or richer towns. Is, is that what you said? Our story is saying that a result came like Malapuram. We surprised why this is coming. Then we actually tried to research it, why this is coming. It might be data aberration. But we are totally wrong because thanks to the, our interviewer and respondent, they have responded. According to UN, United Nations, Malapuram is the highest urbanization rate actually in 2022. And then when we have visited and we have found a lot of remittances are coming. But in this growth story, it is a story of India, inclusive India. We notice it is caste is not having any effect. You will find richness, middle class is also in all the category of the caste. Even in all category of religion, let me say some of the religion, like if you take Sikh are also important, Christian, they are actually the richest concern, misproportion of people richest is from this category. It might be there, might be geography where this, this disadvantage might be. But our data show it is much more inclusive growth is happening currently and which is satisfactory, you can say, development in my opinion. Right. Uh, Rajesh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The rupee tries to go international. If you trade internationally, would you not like a situation wherein the terms of trade with your counterpart are pegged in rupees and not in dollars and you're not watching dollar-rupee movements, praying that some overnight depreciation does not jack up the cost of your imports? All this could change if the rupee is internationalized. And like in most such aspirational projects, a committee from the Reserve Bank has just pronounced that we could do it. An interdepartmental group from the Reserve Bank has said yes, the Indian rupee has the potential to become an internationalized currency. It also suggests a pathways with several do's and don'ts, and getting into all of them at this somewhat early stage may not be worthwhile. But why internationalization, you might ask? Well, the answer is that partly because there's so much global uncertainty, including after the Ukraine war, and us buying so much oil from Russia. More likely, at least I suspect, many folks in policy land are feeling that we have acquired the might and muscle to now trade on our terms rather than be held hostage to the dollar. By the way, the Chinese are also trying to make the RMB an international currency without much success. Now, the thought in itself is not new, but the push is, though it's not clear whether it will succeed if only one-sided and stronger this time. I am no expert in this, but whatever I've seen of trade equations across industry, I suspect that terms and currency preferences cannot be demanded, unless in extreme situations like Russia, where it is shut out by most of the world and thus being unable to trade in the dollar. But even Russia finds it uncomfortable with too many rupees in its pocket. A few months ago, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Denis Valentinovich Manturov had said that because of a lack of imports from India, it is not enough to use the rupee. Last month, Bloomberg reported that a lopsided trade relationship with India is forcing Russia to accumulate $1 billion every month in rupee assets that remain stranded outside the country. So what this means is that you are paying me good money for something I'm selling you, that's oil, but I can't really use the rupees you give me to do much, particularly since I don't buy much from you and I could only and really and mostly use it to buy stuff from you as things stand. I hope you got that. Meanwhile, the print has just reported that India is making about 10% of its payments for Russian oil in the Chinese one, with the rest of the payments being made in Indian rupees and UAE dirhams. So how does internationalization of the rupee play out then? What does it mean or not mean at this point? To understand this better and also how we could gear up if we could and where we could, I reached out to Jayesh Mehta, Managing Director and Treasurer of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in Mumbai. So I think everybody is uh, having a different view. And this is my personal view that I think 
media generally is running much ahead than what RBI thought process is. And this is, again, as I said, like my interpretation of RBI thought process. Basically, when we talk about internalization of rupee, media goes to de-dollarization. And I think that's not the immediate thing as far as RBI is concerned. That's my understanding. All they are doing is basically earlier also we had few neighboring countries where we could do the invoices in rupee, including Singapore. Now they are widening that to more players. And that's where you can settle your trade transactions in rupees. And that's what they mean by internationalization of the rupee is uh, foreigners can have rupee exposure. De-dollarization, it is still a long way, right? It's not that India can do anything about it, but yeah, it is a uh, or maybe a seven, eight, ten years kind of situation. Okay, so let's talk about the internationalization of the rupee rather than the de-dollarization as you mentioned it. So if I was an exporter or an importer, what could it mean even in this short-term period that the Reserve Bank is talking about? The two parts. Uh, one is from the user, whether exporter or importer. He does not have to really worry about the currency as part of it. So his counterpart internationally will be more bothered about the currency. And that's why I say it is just meant in rupees because ultimately the global currency is dollar and ultimately your pricing will be derived out of dollars. So even though you may settle in rupees, it's just the risk which is there on the Indian traders uh, at buyers or seller, exporters or importers, is in the counterparty. My personal view uh, matter much. Right. So if you were to look at it in the in the short to medium term, then even the report talks about many other things like creating a template, a standard approach for invoicing, opening a rupee account for NRIs. How is all of this taking us in that direction? That's number one. Second is, what is the demand supply forces at play here? As in, like I said, if I'm the exporter or importer, I'm also dependent on a counterparty willing to go along with me and my desire to use the rupee. Uh... Singapore, we have a few uh, thing uh, where people have been, so I'm not even right now counting Bangladesh or Nepal or Sri Lanka or anything. I'm talking about Singapore. Had allowed this exactly the same thing long time back. Uh, it's only thing is in the NRI in his account can now earn some interest if there is any INR staying there. But otherwise, it question of uh, whether the counterparties are willing to do that or not. Right. So that's where the challenge is. Until we become sizable enough globally, maybe just like people are now comfortable dealing in CNH or AUD, right? At some point of time, people would be more comfortable dealing with pure INR. Unless they have some linkages, they might be an importer or an exporter, maybe in different between uh, dealing with INR. But there is definitely reluctance from the counterparty side as of now. Yes. And on ground, do you see anyone ever talk about it? I mean, this is a policy led desire or a strategy perhaps, but on ground, do you see any, uh, any such ask or any move? It's not even now, even if you look at last two, three years, we do see some uh, trades from Singapore, which have been coming on and off, but you know, Singapore, India are more aligned. Uh, maybe sometimes your counterpart be in Singapore is having multiple transactions, both import and export to India. The humans might be more willing to do it. But if it is just one-way guy who does not have uh, two-way flows with India, I think for that person, it becomes difficult to have INR as an exposure. So even right now, also post-Russia war, it's all about the trade balance, whether it's the country level or whether it's the individual level. Yes, and I'm going to come to full convertibility in a moment. But when you say size, what's the size you think where you begin to have some clout? I know it's subjective, but I mean, I, this obviously means economic size or amount of trade that we do. I think there are two points to it. So, if, you know, one is size in the sense, uh, if it starts trading internationally, like, you know, you have a lot of people like, having exposure to India. But otherwise, apart from that, it's all about the flow as it's an individual company or the country which has enough in and out flow with India, he would be kind of okay to have his training settled in uh, rupees. But otherwise, if he's having only one-way flow or a country is having one-way flow, they would not be really comfortable on just the uh, plain uh, rupee. And when I say size in the sense like, you know, you think that it has become more resilient to that extent, it's not going to be a depreciating currency, which looks like... But it's too early to say. 
Right. And and last question, you know, one of the points that the IDG report talks about is this uh, full convertibility. Of course, it says that the capital account convertibility is not a precondition for internationalizing the rupee or vice versa. On another level, let's say we are talking about now in some way or the other putting checks on the liberalized remittance scheme. So we are not opening up as much as perhaps we desire on the policy side when it comes to the real world. Yes, uh, no, but I think it's more restrictions coming from the government, more on the taxation side, tracking the tax avoidance. So I really don't see LRS restriction being RBI's restrictions. So that's my personal view again. So RBI is not a restrictive on LRS. It's just uh, the TCS and that part is coming from the ministry because they felt that a lot of people just are buying LRS more than the limits, but they don't have matching income. Now, coming to opening up fully, even if it is, I completely agree, it's not a precondition that people, we need to be convertible fully. If we are convertible fully, then the size matters because then, you know, you might be importing from uh, India, but then you might be exporting somewhere else where, you know, you can settle in rupee if that becomes. But then as of right now, it's going to be more like bilateral with the company or a bilateral with the country where you need to have both sides of flu. And that's where some of the large, I won't name it, but some of the large where we have been trying, uh, we have been the importers there and uh, we have been trying that if it settles in rupee, we also kind of have now allowed the rupee account to earn interest or invest in government securities. But at the end of the day, that rupee being here, it does not help unless I have large imports from India. Otherwise, for the country and for me, it's one and the same because when I convert that back into any other currency, even though I might have settled in rupee, but it is still a foreign currency outflow. Right. Uh, Jesh, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, thanks. Nice seeing you after a long time. Meanwhile, remember that you can pay in rupees at Dubai Duty Free. Two things here, since it's an illustration, this is not new. It came into effect in 2019 and the rupee was the 16th currency to be accepted then. And second, when we say internationalization, we are referring to trade and not duty-free shopping. And hmm, speaking of trade and currency, the Swiss have an interesting problem. Switzerland will apparently import more cheese than it exports this year for the first time. According to the head of the country's dairy association, news reports say, quoting Geneva-based newspaper Le Temps, the opening up of the Swiss milk market has put a squeeze on domestic producers in recent years, prompting many to give up. Boris Burit said so in an interview published on Saturday. Burit said measures needed to be taken to ensure that Switzerland, famous worldwide for high-quality cheese varieties, can continue to produce for its own population. The varieties are Gruyere and Emmentaler. It is obvious that the cheese you think is Swiss, wherever you eat it, may not be actually made in Switzerland, but of course, it may never have been. It's equally likely that depending on the brand, some brands are making their way out and others are making their way in to Switzerland with a net deficit, of course, looming up. But the larger tale is interesting, which is that Switzerland has been seeing a steady decline in dairy companies, particularly small ones, for some years now. One reason, as I could see, is low prices for milk, which disincentivizes farmers whose incomes are falling. There are other changes, including consolidation of farms and thus cow population. Either way, it's not helped. Another interesting trend reflecting more on how consumer tastes can shift rather than what is happening specifically in Switzerland is that increasingly consumers are shifting to vegan alternatives. A report from industry magazine Wedge Economist says that at Coop, one of Switzerland's largest retail and wholesale companies offering over 50 plant-based drinks, one of seven liters of milk sold is vegan. Meanwhile, 63% of the Swiss population now gives up animal-based foods several times a month. Switzerland is a small country, but it's always interesting to note how consumer shifts or preferences can happen and perhaps be ready for it. From Swiss cheese to Indian tomatoes. High prices of tomatoes, around 140 rupees per kg in many parts of India, may have caused McDonald's to stop using tomatoes in its burgers and wraps in many outlets in the north and east of India. Reports say that McDonald's posted notices at some outlets in Delhi saying, for the time being, we are forced to serve you products without tomatoes. 
the American burger and fries chain attributed temporary unavailability of tomatoes to seasonal crop issues arising out of farm fields in a few regions, according to reports. There are not enough quantities meeting our quality specifications available. A spokesperson of McDonald's India, that's north and east, which is different from west and south, is quoted as saying and also adding that the move had nothing to do with the surge in prices. And the rains. You may recall some nervousness all around the middle of last month as we all wondered whether the rains and thus monsoon 2023 would be delayed and thus the potential economic implications of it. Turns out the monsoon was delayed, but an abundance of rains in the first eight days of July has already wiped out the deficit across the country. In figures, India has already seen around 243 millimeters of rain, while the normal value at this time is around 239 millimeters. But within this aggregate figure, as we've seen in previous years, there are variations. East and northeast parts of the country are still at a 17% deficit as of Sunday, while northern India is reporting a 59% excess rainfall. And if you live in Delhi, Chandigarh, or Ambala, you have experienced the sheer horror of what non-stop rain can do to our homes and habitats. Delhi saw 153 mm of rainfall in a 24-hour period ending 8.30 a.m. on Sunday, the highest in a single day since July 1982. Central India too is at a surplus, though much lower. That's it from me this Monday morning. We are seeing more and more high-intensity rains, the kind which most infrastructure, particularly urban, is just not built for. So do take care of yourself wherever you are and see you tomorrow. This was The Core Report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in that is www.thecore.in the core.in or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you, including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>